Awesome. Can we just give it up for our worship team this morning? Man, I'm, it's such an honor and a privilege to serve with them each and every week. And today I got to just be led by them down here on the front. And that's always a pleasure. It's always exciting to be able to be led by them. But, um, well, we have a, a message planned for this morning. But before I jump into that, um, we like to every month honor one of our volunteers from the previous month and really just honor someone that exemplifies what it means to be a volunteer here at Avalon Church. And and what we like to do is shine a spotlight on that volunteer where a spotlight normally doesn't rest. You know, a lot of us, we're kind of on the stage, we're up here, we're speaking, we're talking, we're leading, and you see us, you hear from us, but there are so many people, literally hundreds of people that serve here at Avalon Church on a weekend, week out basis, some in the parking lot, some change diapers in the back, some serve during the week, they're vacuuming, they're cleaning. We have volunteers that serve throughout the week. And this morning I get the privilege of honoring someone that I get to serve closely alongside on a weekly basis. And he makes my job easy. He makes my job really, really easy. And uh, we have a lot of worship team members on our team and and uh, he helps hold things together. And we want to recognize uh, Travis Wells uh, this morning. You can keep playing. You can keep playing. No, no, you can shake my hand. You can shake my hand. Uh, tra- uh, Patrick's, Patrick's going to kill me for going back here. He's like, we can't see you. And so anyway, uh, well, Travis... Uh, He serves pretty much every week, unless he's out of town traveling, he's here. And I just want to tell you something about Travis. Uh, When I first came here five years ago, that's hard to believe, right? Five years ago, um, he helped show me around. He was filling in as our interim uh, uh, worship team director, person, whatever you want to call him. And uh, he was walking me around, and he was playing guitar at that point. And we were walking around backstage, and we saw these keyboards sitting on a shelf, like collecting dust. And I was like, oh, cool, we have keyboards. I was like, man, it'd be really awesome if we could use these, you know, if we had somebody that would play. And, and he told me, he said, he said, well, keys is actually my number one instrument. He said, I'm classically trained, you know. And I was like, here's what we're going to do. We're going to dust the cobwebs off of these things, and we're going to put them on the stage. And literally the last five years, that's where he's been, right back here playing keys for us. And he does an outstanding job. We have the best keys player probably in Atlanta, and I brag on him all the time. And if you see him, you know, out and about, just please tell him thank you um, for all that he does. Here's what he does, and y'all see him. He's got this microphone back here. Tap on that microphone for me. Tap, tap. See, y'all don't hear that. That microphone is not in the house. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a behind-the-scenes kind of idea of what goes on up here on a Sunday. Um, that microphone, y'all see us wearing these headphones, right, that we have these headphones in our, in our ears. And basically what we have going on in there is it helps us be able to hear you know, what's going on. You know, back in the day, we had these big floor wedges on the stage, and they were super loud and obnoxious, and they made people's hearing bad. But one thing they didn't allow you to do is have a click track, you know. Keeps everybody on, on beat, on tempo. And so there's, there's lots of things that go to our in-ear mix, and, um, but there's one that's very, very, very important, and that is the click and the guide. And... The, the guy, yeah, we're going to clap in a second. And so the, the click in the guide is very, very important. Because if you don't have the click in the guide, it all falls apart. The click in the guide keeps us on tempo. And then the guide helps tell us where we are in the song and what's coming next. And, and we have pre-programmed guides for some songs. But then like three out of the four songs you heard this morning, there wasn't a pre-programmed guide for it. So in those moments, Travis steps up and he's talking to us. And sometimes... He tells us jokes and tells us funny things and how we need to do better and, you know, shape up. And sometimes we forget the chords and he's like, Jonathan, it's a D. G, you know, he's like calling the chords because I can't remember. And so that's what he does. And it's invaluable, his role back here. And our worship team is outstanding. I brag on them all the time and we're better because of Travis. And so can we just give him one last round of applause this morning? See, in order for our worship team to be successful, there's a few things that we need to have in our ears, and Travis is one of them. And for you to be successful in your Christian walk, there's a few things 
there's, there's a few things you need to hear, but there's one that's very invaluable, and that's the voice of God. That's the voice of God. So we're gonna talk this morning a little bit about hearing from God, but more specifically about those times in our life where it's hard to hear God speaking. Those times in life where we don't hear him very clearly. Anybody ever experience a season like that where it just feels like God's just absent? You don't have to put your hand down. You can, we're all there. We all should have our hand in there. Times in our life where it just seems like God is so far away, so absent, we don't hear him speaking. And, and maybe that was you uh, this last year. Maybe all of 2021, you're just in this dark place where you're not really hearing from God. You're not really connecting with him. And maybe you've been in that season longer Maybe, maybe you don't even remember the last time you felt that. Maybe you don't even remember the last time you felt God really speaking and conversing with you. And, 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 and there was a time in your life maybe where you remember hearing from God and talking to God. And it was so awesome to, to start your morning off with the Lord and read your Bible and hear from him. But then all of a sudden life gets crazy. Life gets busy. You get, you know, kids, you get a mortgage. You got a, a small startup business. You've got a full iCal on your phone that's alerting you of places to be and people to meet. You've got softball games. You've got all these things that just start making all this noise and somewhere along the line, God just gets lost in the mix. Somewhere along the line, God, his voice gets lost in the mix. And so the title of my message today is Fix your mix. Fix your mix. See, God gave me this message several months ago. We were actually coming to a rehearsal on a Sunday morning, and I had a band member just kind of speak up and said, hey, I'm not able to hear very well. I'm, I can't hear anything really clearly. And so I took his pack, and I went to the back, and I went to his uh, little monitor control board thing that's in the back and has all these knobs of what we can turn up and turn down in our ears. And what I encountered is when I went to his, I started going through the different things and everything was turned all the way up. Everything was turned all the way up. And when that happens in the audio world, that's not a good thing, right? We call it a mix for a reason because some things need to be in the background, some things need to be in the forefront. But when everything gets pushed up to the max, it creates a wall of sound that it basically makes everything unintelligible. You can't tell what's going on. You can't tell the guitar from the keys. You can't tell where the bass is. And you can't tell and hear the click and the guide. And that's a problem. That's a problem. So here's, here's the thing I want, want to start us out with this morning. Is when you can't hear God talking. It's not that he's not talking. It's that you can't hear him. See, God speaks. God moves. But sometimes we've got things in our life and in our world turned up so loud we can't hear him. And so this morning, I want us to tone in on how we can fix our mix. See, the question isn't whether God is speaking. It's whether you've got your mix right in order to hear him. Because when we're up here and we're playing, the click track's always going. Travis is always guiding, but if our mix is off, we don't hear where we're at in the song. And I was chatting with a couple here at our church the other week at our Hope for Families event, and we were standing out here, and we were talking, and they were just sharing with me how they're in a season where they just feel God speaking and God moving in their life. And it was just amazing to hear, because we hear so often about people that aren't experiencing that, to, but to, to talk to someone that is experiencing that was just refreshing. And so if you're here today, and you're just having trouble hearing from God, tune in. Please don't, please don't be distracted. Please try not to think about what you have to do later today or tomorrow when you go back to work or the next day or what's coming up. Try to focus in because God's gonna speak today. As he does every week, we just have to be in a position to hear it. Sometimes you need to turn things down in order to hear it. And as I was praying about what to, what to speak and how to put all this together, God directed me to a story in the Bible as he always does. And, uh, he directed me to the story of Elijah. And we're going to read um, here in Elijah 
or we're going to read about Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19. So if you have your Bibles this morning, go ahead and turn there. If not, it's going to be on the screen. So I'm going to have us do something a little bit different this morning. Um, can we stand? Can we stand to read God's word this morning? And there's a reason behind this. It's out of respect for his word, but then also there's, there's a part in this story that you're gonna see in a second where when God speaks to Elijah, he says, get up, stand, because the presence of the Lord is about to pass by. And let's not take this lightly. The presence of the Lord is in the room today. And maybe for you, he's about to pass by. And so we stand and we make ourselves ready to receive what he has for us this morning. So let's stand, let's read this. It's gonna be a little bit of portion of scripture. Maybe this story's familiar, but just bear with me, it's good. So 1 Kings 19, verse one, let's start reading there. It says, now Ahab called Jezebel every, told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Verse three, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba and Judah, he left his servants there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out, here it is, and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? God, I pray that you speak today. God, I pray that you take these words that you've given me, this message you've spoken over my life already and the time spent preparing it. God, I pray that you have your way through it now, that you speak and do what only you can do. God, I'm only a man, but I'm used by you today. So would you speak? May these words be your words, not my words. May this be your moment, not my moment. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You guys take a seat. If you're sitting by somebody, ask them, how's your mix? How's your mix? See, this story may be familiar to some of us that grew up in the church, you know, especially the end of the story where Elijah's in the cave and, you know, all these things happen. The wind comes, the earthquake comes, the fire comes, and then the voice of the Lord speaks as a gentle whisper. And so this story is can be familiar to some of us, but before we get ahead of ourselves, before we get to the cave, we need to understand Elijah's condition. All right, before we can get to the cave and what happened there, we need to understand his condition. And my outline's super simple this morning. The first point's this, the condition. The condition. See, Elijah was 
a prophet. He was a mighty man of God. Elijah had seen a lot of things happen. And we have a couple chapters before this one in the Bible that tell us, man, he saw a boy resurrected. He, God fed him through the ravens. God supplied for his needs. The chapter before this, we see him go up against the prophets of Baal, and God rained down fire from heaven, consumed the altar that Elijah had flooded with water, worked this massive miracle. God helped him slay the 450 prophets of Baal. And here, just a few hours later, maybe a few days later, we see a different Elijah than we read about in those previous chapters. See, Elijah thought that this victory at Mount Carmel over the prophets of Baal was going to bring revival in the land. It was going to turn the nation around. They were going to repent of their sin. They were going to get right with God. And and man, there was going to be this massive revival, and that's not what happened. It just brought more threats on Elijah's life. So when it didn't play out the way Elijah thought it should play out, he runs. And we see that. We see that in the scripture we just ran, read. It says that he ran when the threats came. And so what, I want to point out something to us this morning that, that I think is, is that God showed me as I was kind of reading the whole story of Elijah. Let's back up a couple chapters because what we see in this chapter is a different Elijah than what we saw previously. And so it says this back in 1 Kings chapter 17. We're going to put the scriptures up here. We're going to blow through a couple of these really quick. It said in 1 Kings 17 uh, verse 2, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. It says, Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth ravine east of the Jordan. And skip down to verse 5. It says, So he did what the Lord did. Had told him. So see the theme in in verse two. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, and then verse five. So he did what the Lord had told him. In 1 Kings 17, verse 8, if we skip ahead a little bit in that chapter, we see this. Then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once. And then skip to, to verse 10, just down a couple lines. So he went. Then the word of the Lord came to him, and so he went. We, we see in a trend here, just one more so we can see it again. In the next chapter, in verses 1 and 2, it says, after a long time in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went. And so we see a trend here. Nowhere, nowhere in this key scripture that we read a second ago did we see God tell Elijah to run. There was no, in the word of the Lord, Elijah, run for your life. There, was, there, wasn't, there wasn't any of that. No, Elijah was distracted from what God was trying to do. And, and that's so much like us, right? Like life doesn't play out, doesn't pan out the way we think it's going to play out. And so we've seen God come through. We've seen God do amazing things. We read stories in the Bible. We've witnessed him in our life. We've, we've witnessed amazing things. But then when there's a turn of events that things don't play out the way we think they should play out, then all of a sudden we, God, what's going on? And we run and we hide And we get distracted from what God's trying to do in our life. It reminds me of the Israelites, right? When God brings them out of Egypt, amazingly so, you know, and he brings them to the the Red Sea. And then all of a sudden it's like, man, why don't we just go back? It was better in Egypt. And then God works a miracle and takes them through the Red Sea. And then they get to the other side and they're praising and they're praising God and they're rejoicing. And then all of a sudden they get into the desert and they're like, oh, God, you brought us out here to die. And, and, and God ends up feeding them. And then one time after another, one time after another, they just continue to doubt God when things don't play out the way they think they should. And our disappointments sometimes lead to distraction. And when we're distracted, we don't hear from the Lord like we should. There was a, there develops a problem with our mix. And so Elijah had a problem With this mix, he had all these things going on in his head and around him that he wasn't hearing from God like he once did. See, here's the thing to go back to our original kind of illustration of our worship team and our inner mixes and and all of that stuff. When the worship team, team stops listening to what Travis is calling in the back, we run into problems. And we encounter this all the time. 
<laughs> Those that are on the worship team, I got a sly little grin right now because there's times in rehearsal where we just have to shut it down. And Travis is like, obviously you can't hear what I'm saying because you're playing the bridge chords and we're on the chorus and that don't jive. That don't work because you're playing the wrong chords on top of what, what we're playing. Sometimes we've had songs with key changes and sometimes people are playing in the previous key and they're playing in B and we're playing in C and that just don't jive, that doesn't go and so we have to kind of shut it down and reset. And when you have a problem with your mix, you don't hear from God like you should. When, when God is telling you to, to stay and you start to go, you run into problems if you're not listening to what he's saying. If, if he says to go left and you go right, then we run into problems. I, I thought about Jonah when I was reading this, you know, because God said, hey, go to Nineveh and preach to the people in Nineveh. And just the next verse, what does Jonah do? He goes the opposite direction, buys a boat ticket to go across the ocean to go the opposite direction from where God's telling him to go. And then lo and behold, a storm comes and then a whale swallows him. And man, we're, we're all in a mess now. And I don't know about you, but I like to avoid all encounters with whales in my life. I don't, don't want God to have to send a whale in my life to get my attention, but sometimes he loves us too much not to send the whale to not do what he has to do to get our attention, to, to, to get us out of being distracted. Not only was Elijah distracted, but he was also drained. Look at this, look at this, back in our key text in chapter 19. So Elijah ran, and it says, he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there were, by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. I love the fact that despite our doubt and our lack of understanding that God is with us, God still meets us where we are and supplies for our needs. Even when I'm running and I'm going the opposite direction from what God's telling me to do, he still meets me where I am. And he meets you where you are. I love that about our vision statement here as a church, bringing people wherever they are and to a growing relationship with Jesus. That despite your struggles, despite your addictions, despite your holdups, despite your, your uh, insecurities, despite your lack of understanding, your doubt, your lack of faith, God still meets you where you are and supplies for your needs. And right here, Elijah, he's exhausted, he's drained, he collapses under this bush, and God sends an angel and says, hey man, get up and eat. Get up and eat. He met Elijah's needs right where he was. Elijah was drained of the resources he needed to do that which God had called him to do. See, we don't make good decisions when we're tired. We definitely don't make good decisions when we're hungry. And uh, it reminds me of that Snickers commercial, right? You know, and the people are just angry and they're, they're, uh, they're a certain person, but the character that you see is a different actor and, and they're angry and they're frustrated and they said, hey man, eat this. You're not yourself when you're hungry and they eat the Snickers bar and then they're, they're better and they're themselves again because they quenched you know, the hunger. Some of you today need a spiritual Snickers bar because you're not yourself when you're hungry. You can ask our staff, I'm not myself when I'm hungry. And I, I don't know if you know this about me, I don't really eat breakfast very often, if ever. And uh, I have my coffee and all that in the morning, but I look forward so much to lunchtime. And I'll tell you, man, if we're in a meeting, and it's 11, 11.30, 12 o'clock, and that stomach starts rumbling. They start looking at me, and they know, hey, our productivity level is about to go way down, way down until we get this man something to eat. And so then we start, you know, the meeting turns into from strategizing and vision casting into figuring out where are we going to go for lunch. And sometimes this is a lengthy affair, you know, 30 minutes here just trying to decide where are we going to go eat, you know, and, uh, but we know we got to get John something to eat because we're not going to be able to accomplish much when he's hungry. 
And I know I've got flaws just like everyone around here. And I know you're thinking, hey, you should be able to push through. You should be able to focus despite the hunger. There's work to be done. The gospel's got to go forward. But I've still got to eat, right? And so I've got flaws. I've got hangups. I'm not perfect. And so you're not yourself when you're hungry. And so twice, look at this, twice the angel came to Elijah and said, get up, man, eat. He was so depleted of his resources. He was so drained that twice he had to eat and twice he had to sleep. And sometimes the best thing you can do for yourself is get something to eat and rest and rest. And I know our culture doesn't talk a lot about resting, but God sure does. God sure does. And, and maybe the best thing you can do today after church, and I know it's rainy, it's nasty outside, and you're probably not gonna go do much anyway, but the best thing that some of you can do today, you're so tired, you're so drained, you're so frustrated with the way life is, the best thing you can do is go get something good to eat and just go home, take a nap, get up, spend some time with your kids, and then go to bed. I guarantee you, your Monday will be a lot better tomorrow if you just get something to eat and get some rest. And I know that sounds super simple, but how many times do we skip meals? How many times do we stay up late, you know, burning the midnight oil, trying to get things done, trying to meet deadlines? And sometimes all you need to do is just say, hey, tomorrow we'll take care of tomorrow, but right now I just need to rest. Right now, I just need to get some rest because when we're tired, when we're depleted, when we're drained, we don't process and think very clearly. And this was Elijah. He was exhausted. He was drained. And so God sent an angel to meet his needs. He said, get up and eat. Taste and see that the Lord is good. But I know you're frustrated. I know you're disappointed. I know things haven't played out the right way. But here, just, I've prepared you something to eat right here in the middle of where you are. And so he did that. He ate and he rested and then he continued on his journey. Look at this in verse nine. It says, there he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. Look what he said. What are you doing here, Elijah? Now that Elijah's had rest, now that he's eaten something, now that he's, you know, recovered from everything that's going on, he's hearing from the Lord. And he says, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And so Elijah makes it to the cave. This is part two this morning, the cave. The cave. See, Elijah probably wasn't the first person to be in the cave. A lot of historians, a lot of Bible scholars, they believe that this possibly could be the same cave that Moses was in when he was on the mountain and he asked to see the glory of the Lord. And, and it's, then scripture tells us that God put Moses in the cleft of the rock and said, hey, I'm gonna pass by and I'm only gonna show you my backside because if you saw the front, you would just fall down dead. I'm just gonna show you a glimpse of my presence. I'm just gonna pass by for a split second and that split second radically changed Moses' life. He came down and they said his face was glowing. And, and so a lot of people sort of believe, and this hasn't been proven, there's no way for us to know for sure, but that the same cave could be the same place that Elijah ended up in this occasion. And maybe he knew scripture and he knew what had happened in Moses' case and, and that's where he fled to this cave. See, the cave is a well-visited place, and if you find yourself in the cave today, like Elijah, if you find yourself isolated, if you find yourself uh, pushed away from society, if you find yourself trapped in your own mind and things are just so noisy and things are just so cluttered and you don't know what's going on, if you find yourself in that place today, know that you're not alone. It could be very well that the person sitting next to you is in their own cave, that the person sitting next to you is in their own whale, you know, that God has them in a place that he wants to do something in their life. He wants to do a work in their life and God wants to do a work in your life. God wants to use that cave to produce greatness in you. 
God wants to use it to do something in your life if you'll let him, if you'll tune in, if you'll pay attention, if you'll let him do that. And the way he does it is he starts it with a question. See, the cave comes with a question. Look at that verse again. It said, Elijah went into the cave and he spent the night. And it says, and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? How did you get here? How did you end up this way? Who told you to come here? Why are you here? What are you doing here? See, see God knew, God knew where Elijah was and he knew how he ended up there. But what he wanted was for Elijah to see where he was. And he wanted Elijah to figure out how he got there. That was the point of the question. That was the point of the question. What are you doing here? And it's a similar question to what God asked Adam and Eve back in the garden when they first sinned and they took the fruit and they ate when God told them not to eat. And when they did, they realized they were naked. And so they took fig leaves and they sewed them together and they hid from the Lord. And it said, when God came in the cool of the day, looking for Adam and Eve, it says he was looking for them and he was calling out to them. And then when he, when he finds them, he asks, who told you? Who told you you were naked? Who told you that? Who have you been listening to? How did you end up this way? You used to listen to me. You used to take your beats off of me, but now it seems that you're listening to someone else, that you're tuning into someone else, that, that someone is tuned up in your, turned up in your mix louder than I am. Who told you to come here? How did you end up here? And Elijah had let his fear and his doubt speak louder than God's voice in his life. He let his fear and his doubt tell him what to do. It used to be God's voice that told him where to go and what to do, but now Elijah's got a problem with his mix and God's voice is being drowned out by the noise around him and the noise in his head. And so Elijah needed to fix his mix, so God told him what to do. And it says this in verse 10, it says, the Lord said, go out, stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, and, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. So after all these things had Past after all of these raucous things had, had ended, he heard God's voice. And sometimes we need to let the cave isolate us from everything that's around us. Like I said, God wants to use it. Maybe you ended up in the cave, maybe you're there because of disobedience or distraction, but even so, God can use that to work it together for your good. And he's got a plan for your life. He's got a purpose for your life. And he wants to speak to you. But sometimes he's got to get you into a place where everything can be stripped away and you can hear from him. So you can hear the call. And this is the last thing. We've seen Elijah's condition. We've seen the cave. And now it's time for the call. Now it's time for the call. For Elijah to hear the call, he needed to fix his mix, though. He had letting things get so out of control. He had lost touch with God's voice. He had forgotten what it sounded like. But then he realized, after everything passed, that God's voice was in the silence. Once everything got quiet enough, he could hear God speak. He could hear God speak and there was a time in my life when I, before I came down here, I was doing a, a residency up on the north side of Atlanta at, at a church. And my mentor up there, the worship pastor at that church, when I first went there, probably this is probably my first week or my second week there, he had me and one of our other residents there do an exercise. And he was teaching this principle of how to hear from the Lord, how to hear his voice. And I know that's a confusing thing you know, we talk about hearing from God, and some people are like, what does that sound like? How do you know? Is it an audible voice? No, it's not an audible voice. 
It's the same way that you hear the thoughts in your head. You know, all these things that are saying things to you, telling you different things here or there, you know, things that you're processing in your mind. And sometimes we just have to get to a point where we quiet all that down so we can hear from him. And here's, here's what Dwayne told me to do. He said, I want you to go find a place, and I want you to spend all afternoon. This was, you know, right after lunch. He said, hey, until the end of the day, I want you to go, and he called it sitting, sitting in solitude. <laughs> he said, leave your phone here. Take this notepad and a pen. And he said, I want you to go. Find somewhere to sit. I don't care where it is. Don't be around anybody. Just get quiet. Get alone. And he said, it's going to be one of the hardest things you've ever done. <laughs> Just to go sit for four or five hours. Just in quiet. And he said, here's what I want you to do. He said, I want you to take this notepad. I want you to take this pen. And as you sit and you, you pray, I want you to write down the things that you hear in your head. It sounds crazy, right? And I was like, okay. And so I did this. I kind of went out. We had this little pond out in the front in the, around the parking lot. And we had these park benches around it. And I went and sat down in one. And man, the first 30 minutes, tough. And you, you're reaching for your phone. You want something to do because it's just, it's so, you know, counter what we know in our culture, right, to just sit and not do something, to sit and not have Instagram, you know, to sit and not have a meeting, to sit and not have any sort of agenda other than just to hear from the Lord. This was just so foreign to me. It's so foreign to our culture, but he knew I needed this. And so he said, hey, take this pen and take this notepad. I want you to write stuff down. And he said, here's what you do. You're gonna write stuff down, things that you just hear in your head. And then you're going to take it and you're going to compare it to Scripture. And things that aren't found in Scripture are lies from the devil. And then things that are true, that's your father talking to you. That's your father speaking. And he says, here's what you'll find out is there's going to be a lot of stuff that you hear at first because the enemy speaks first. He said, God's voice comes later. Sit and wait and you'll hear him. And I did this, and I wrote all these things down, questions about where I was in my, well, in my walk with God. You know, not understanding, some of it was personal stuff, like, you know, not understanding, God, what are you doing in my life? What are you doing? This exercise is crazy. Why am I doing this? This is ridiculous. Can I have Ableton? Can I do Ableton? That's a lot of fun. Can I plan a service? Can I, can I do some music? Can I play my guitar? No, just sit. And I sat there and I wrote these things down and I learned to hear God's voice in the silence. And it taught me an invaluable lesson that day, sitting at that lake, pond, whatever you want to call it, there in that parking lot. It taught me that if you get quiet enough, if you get still enough, if you set aside the distractions, you'll hear his voice. And maybe today you've never heard his voice because you've never got quiet enough to hear it. Maybe you've never got still enough to hear it. Maybe you've never created space to hear it. See, here, here's the thing. I tell, I tell our guys, I tell our musicians and our worship team members when we're working on our mix in the back, sometimes it's not about what you can turn up in your mix, but what can you turn down in order to hear that which is important. There's lots of things, lots of options back here. There's lots of options that we can turn up. We can turn the drums up. We can turn the bass up. We can turn the guitars up. We can turn the track up. We can turn all the vocalists up. And it can be awesome. But if it's not mixed right, if we've got everything turned too loud, then we don't hear that which is important. And the important thing is the click track and the guide. That tells us what to do and where to go. Other things are useful. It's good to hear the, other, the, the worship leader. It's good to hear the guitar parts. It's good to hear all these different things. But the most important thing, the click and the guide. 
And in your life, there are lots of things that are good to get to weigh into your life. There are people that you could talk to. There's the news, there's social media, there's TV, there's this, there's that, there's work. There's all these things that fight for attention, fight for space in your mix. And sometimes you just have to learn what can I turn down in order to create more space for God in my mix. It's not about what can I turn up. The last thing we need to do is turn stuff up. What we need to do is learn, what can I turn down? What's not important? What is only supplemental to my life, but what's important to my life? What's important to my life? We have to learn to turn down what's unimportant, to hear what is important. And as we focus on what's important, we'll tune our heart to hear God's voice. We'll learn what it sounds like. We'll learn to hear it, and it'll get easier you may not have to sit as long. I want you to kind of learn how to do this and hear from the Lord. And I love this illustration. Jesus, whenever he taught, he talked a lot about sheep and shepherds because that was, you know, a part of their culture. There were sheep and shepherds everywhere. Even if you go to the Holy Land today, you still see sheep and shepherds. You know, they're a thing. And it doesn't make much sense to us because we don't see, maybe if we were in our culture, we talk about cows. I don't know, because you see cows everywhere. Um, cows are about as dumb as sheep, and so maybe it would work. I don't know. But Jesus taught a lot about sheep. Here's the crazy thing about sheep, and I was even like kind of looking up videos. I thought about showing one. I was like, no, we don't have time for that. And so what happens, and they, if you go to the Holy Land, they'll do this. They'll walk you out to these pastures where these sheep are with their shepherds, and they'll have people on the tour call out a name, because they name the sheep. All the sheep have names, and I think that's an awesome picture in, in, of what Jesus was teaching, you know, because he knows each of us by name. You know, we're not just a, a group. No, he knows you specifically. He knows your passions, what you love. He knows what you don't love. You know, he knows where your struggle is and, and all these things. He knows everything about you. He has, he's given you a name. And, uh, and, and all these sheep, they have names. And what they'll do is they'll have these people on the tour. They'll say, hey, call this sheep's name. And they'll holler it and they'll call it out. And, you know, sheep, sheep are dumb, you know. And so they're just out there. They're grazing in the pasture, a bunch of sheep. So they'll do this. They'll have different guys try it. Yell the name, yell the name as loud as you can. And they'll yell it. And then what they'll do is they'll have the shepherd come. <laughs> and they'll have the shepherd say the sheep's name. And that sheep will just pop his head up. And he'll come he heard the shepherd's voice. He heard the shepherd's voice because he's learned to tune out everyone else. Everyone else is a danger, stranger danger, right? There's one that I need to know, and that's my shepherd's voice. And there's someone here today, you've got a lot of things calling your name. You've got a lot of things fighting for your attention. What you need to do is learn God's voice. When God's voice speaks, that's when you listen. That's when you step forward. That's when you come out from hiding. Jesus said this in John chapter 10. He said, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Sheep know how to hear, what to ignore, and who to follow. That's powerful. There's a reason Jesus described us as his sheep. Not just because you're dumb. We are dumb, by the way. No, because we know sheep know what to hear. They know what to ignore. And they know who to follow. And so now that Elijah's, he's had this experience in the cave, he's seen God's presence in the gentle whisper and the still calm voice. It says this, it says this in 1 Kings 19, verse 13. It says, when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Notice this, if you, if you look back in the story, he told Elijah, he said, to, he told him to stand and to go out on the mountain because the Lord's presence was about to pass by. But Elijah didn't move. He stayed where he was. And now that he's hearing God's voice again, 
Now that he's having his mix reset, he hears his voice and he pulls his cloak over his face and he steps out to the mouth of the cave. He moves. And here's the thing. The cave has served its purpose at this point. The cave has reacquainted Elijah with God's voice. It's fixed his mix. He's learned to hear God yet again. And now that he's heard from God, he moves to the mouth of the cave. See, here's the thing to understand about the cave. The cave isn't a permanent destination. It's a temporary dwelling. And so if you're there today, if you're in this place where you just feel like God is so far away and you're running from God, you're trying to get away from your struggles, you're trying to get away from everything that's happening around you, you're like Elijah, you're just running from God. If you find yourself there today and he gives you the opportunity to reset your mix, when you hear from him, go to the mouth of the cave because the mouth of the cave is the exit. It's time to go. It's time to go. It's time to go. Look at, look at what happens next in the story. In verse 15, it says, the Lord said to him, go back the way you came. Go back the way you came. The same path that brought you here needs to take you back where you came from. Remember, remember God's question, how did you get here? Or what are you, he asked him, what are you doing here? He was there because he was in the cave and he was here because he wasn't there. God had a purpose for Elijah. He had him right where he wanted him when he turned and he ran and he came to the cave. What he was doing there God was using him. He just got distracted by his disappointments and things not playing out the way he thought they should play out. So God's saying, now that you've come here, we've used the cave, now you gotta go. Now you gotta get out of here. Now you have to go back. And some of us, we've been praying, maybe you've been hoping that God would change your current situation and, and, and you've, you've retreated to the cave and, and God's speaking today and he's, and he's showing you some things. He's gonna reacquaint you with his voice and then God's gonna say, now it's time to go back. Because we don't always get to leave the cave and go into a new season. We don't always get to leave the cave and go back healed. We don't always get to leave the cave and go back and everything's gonna be the way it should be. No, God said, go back the way you came. Go back where I had you, because I'm not done with you. I'm not through with you. There's still a mission to accomplish. There's still things that need to be done. There's still a calling on your life. There's still mighty ways that I'm gonna use you. And so I need you to go back. I know it might not be ideal. I know it might not make sense. I know it might not be what you thought you signed up for, but I need you to go back because I'm not done with you yet. But when you go back, I need you to follow me. I need you to listen to me. No matter how tough it gets, no matter how discouraged you may get, no matter what comes up against you, I need you to pay attention. I need you to listen to me because I call the shots. You don't call the shots, Elijah. I direct your paths. And so he said, go back. You can't stay here. You gotta get back to work. And so he actually, he gave them, he gave him three things to do when he left the cave. He gave him three things to do. He said, now that you've rested, now that you've heard from me, now that you remember what my voice sounds like, now that you've fixed your mix, I need you to get to work. And what I hear God speaking to us today is, get a word and get to work. Get a word and get to work. Because here's what I believe we do sometimes. I believe we, we hear God's voice in a moment like, 
like today, or maybe we're in a church service, or maybe we're at camp, or maybe we're, you know, in a revival service or whatever. Maybe we're at home and we're just having an awesome day of quiet time, you know, and we hear God speak and we're like, man, I hear you speaking. I hear you telling me what I need to do. And then we, we, we're, we're in the mouth of the cave. We're positioned to, to receive from God what he has for us. And then we, when we step back into the cave. And we take a seat back in the cave and God's saying, no, you gotta go. Get a word and get to work. And maybe you don't like your current situation. Maybe you don't like where you're at, but God can still use you wherever it is. Maybe you're hoping for a new job. Maybe your marriage is struggling. Don't run, get a word, and get to work and let God use you. And I love this, lastly, in, in verse 19, God had said, go back the way you came. And he gave him three things to do because he knew the best thing for Elijah was to get back to work. Stop sitting, that's not what I've called you to do. Need you to get back to work. And it says, so Elijah went from there. I feel like we've come full circle from where Elijah was in the previous chapters. And the Lord said, and so Elijah did. And here Elijah obeys the word of the Lord and he went from there to get back to work. So my question today is how's your mix? When's the last time you really heard from the Lord? When's the last time you sat in silence, removed the distractions, put your phone down, and just said, hey, here I am. Here I am. I want to be used by you. I want to hear from you. God, would you speak to me? Would you give me a word from you? How's your mix? And so today, we just want to create a space to just sit. And I know time's getting away from us. Don't think about that. Don't think about where you're going to go for lunch. Don't think about what you have to do this afternoon. Don't think about what's on the calendar and the agenda for this week. I just want to create a space you just to sit, and it may seem ridiculous, and it may seem uncomfortable. God wants to say something to somebody this morning. And a lot of times the service is important, the songs we sing are important, the message that is preached is important, but sometimes the most important part of a Sunday morning is what you do the 15 minutes after it's done. And so often we get up and we blow out of these doors and we hit the hit the restaurants, and we move on with our week, and we fail to ask, God, what are you saying to me? What are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to show me? And maybe we're so distracted and so disappointed and so drained because we're not spending time like we should, just in silence. We're not quiet enough. We're not still enough. And so this morning, we're just going to give you four minutes. Just sit. Just ask God, speak to me. Speak to me. He will. He will. Father, we thank you today that you are with us, that your Holy Spirit's in the room. And would you speak to us now? Would you show each and every one of us what it is that you want us to know? Would you reacquaint us with your voice? Would you show us what to hear, what to ignore, who to follow? 
So we just surrender this moment to you. Whatever it is, Lord, that you want to speak to us, we give you this moment, we give you this time. Would you speak? Would you speak? Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the Give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.